Travel all over the countryside, Oscar Leyland, Oscar Leyland. Travel all over the countryside, Oscar Leyland, brother. Whatever it is that you want to see, Oscar Leyland, Oscar Leyland. No matter whatever that happens to be, Oscar Leyland, brother. Australia is a land of birds. We're going to take you to a place where 600,000 people visit per year just to look at the colourful lorikeets. Here at Corumbin in Queensland. And then we're off to the North Island of New Zealand, to a village near Rotorua that was entirely buried by boiling mud during a devastating volcanic eruption. There are only three places left in Australia where they make cheese on the farm. We're going to visit one of these at Winnelea in northeastern Tasmania. We've all heard of Krakatoa and Pompeii, but who ever heard of Tiwairoa? Tiwairoa was the name of a Maori village which used to exist on this very site in 1886. And on the 10th of June 1886, it suffered an enormous, devastating volcanic eruption, just like Pompeii and Krakatoa. It happened when Mount Tarawea, which is about 14 kilometres over this way, exploded in the middle of the night and completely buried this village along with several other Maori villages in the area. We've come here to have a look at it because of a letter from Mrs Lorna Neverson from Gwenville in New South Wales who writes and says Tarawara Mountain was the site of New Zealand's greatest volcanic eruption and the information you could gather would be interesting to viewers of all ages. Well we agree with Mrs Neverson and we've come to have a look at the village but before we take a look at the village let's just consider what devastation took place on the 10th of June 1886. The Maori village of Tiwairoa was the stepping off point for visitors to take a native canoe across Lake Tarawea to see what was considered by all to be the eighth wonder of the world. Magnificent white and pink terraces of crystal formations. These remarkable creations of nature held all who were privileged to see them spellbound. They rose in succession from the lake to a huge crater of boiling water, each rise large enough to provide a huge swimming pool. A succession of crystal steps rising 300 metres Standing at their base and unable to see the top, many a visitor exclaimed that this must surely be the steps that lead to heaven. Maori guide Sophia, who took world travellers to the terraces, claimed to have seen a ghost canoe on the lake a few days before the eruption. And this was considered to be a bad omen by the Tahanga, or village witch doctor, and he predicted the destructive eruption. It came four days later at the 10th of June, 1886, at 4 a.m. in the morning. In the stark light of dawn, the true devastation was apparent. Red-hot volcanic bombs and jagged masses of exploding rock rained from the sky, along with a teeming avalanche of boiling red-hot mud. The guide Sophia's substantial hut survived. The mud ran off the steep roof, but entombed the 80 natives that sheltered inside. They eventually dug their way free. Tiwairoa was obliterated. An occasional roof pierced the still steaming mud. Trees appeared to have survived an atomic explosion and Mount Tarawea had been ripped open by the enormous forces of the inner earth. The gaping hole in the mountain extends some eight kilometres, and the debris from the enormous eruption covered an area of over 1,000 square kilometres. The explosion was heard in Christchurch, 1,200 kilometres away. An entire lake, Lake Rotomahana, had disappeared along with half the mountain. But most tragic of all, the magnificent terraces nature had fashioned over thousands of patient years nature took away in a few explosive hours. Now, as we walk around the buried village today, we can go into what used to be the old buildings. For instance, this building behind me is where the blacksmiths used to live. And this ground that we're walking on is the original floor level. 
As you can see, the mud has built up here on the sides. This was all molten sort of mud, red hot, to a height of almost two metres. And the second building, which has been built on the site of the old one, is the original blacksmith's shop. There's nothing left of the old timbers and that. And the rest of the village is spread out mostly down through here. The fertile mud promotes lush growth today, but the half-buried huts give some clue to the terror which reigned through the night. Fortunately, only 60 Maoris lost their lives in the Holocaust. Most were saved, amazingly, by the flimsy, sloping roofs of the native huts. Escape tunnels for use in tribal warfare were of no use during the attack by nature. Now, it was inside this native wire, or hut, that the Tohonga, that's the chap you may remember, the witch doctor type bloke who had predicted this was going to happen, he managed to survive the eruption inside there. This hut was survived. Four days he was inside. The other Maoris that also survived wouldn't let him out because they blamed him, you see, for what had happened. And after four days, a European rescue party dug him out and to their amazement, he was alive. He only lived another five days before he died. And this hut has been excavated, as you can see, they've dug most of around the side. It was covered mostly in hot mud. But of course, being 101, it was impossible for the old man to dig his way out. Lovely green bushland has grown over the entire village site, except in the spots where excavation has taken place. The old baker's oven, remarkably well preserved. This is all that remains of the old hotel, 90 years after it happened. You can still see where the excavation's been taking place. It's of corrugated iron. Apparently there was a wall running across here separating one room from another one. There's a, an old stove over there. Very little at all really. At the moment they're still trying to find where the cellar may have been. After all there could be plenty of old somewhat mature wine still buried under the ground. But all this excavation work that's been going on has been taking place since 1936. And even today they're, they're still carrying on the excavation work and still unearthing quite some interesting things. something there now, is it, Laurie? Yes, it feels as though we're onto something fairly hard. It's either a bit of china or metal. Yes, now, yeah, this, it's, it's a bit of china, all right? You can just see the outer rim. Yeah, there's another bit. That's been underground for 90-odd years. It's kept its blue pigmentation very well. If it were not for the excavation, there would be little to see at the buried village of Tiwairoa. And if it were not for early photographers, nothing to see of the famous terraces. The only permanent reminder of the 10th of June, 1886, is this savage wound in the crust of the earth at Mount Tarawea. Every day, Australian native birds face man-made threats to their existence. The destruction of feeding and breeding grounds, senseless slaughter by shooters, and always the introduced killers, foxes and feral cats. With increasing awareness of the need to save our unique wildlife, comes the desire for many people to see for themselves these wild creatures. This is one place where thousands of Australians, as well as overseas visitors, have had the wonderful experience of close contact with some of our most beautiful birds. We're at Corumban in Queensland. Our holder of Cootamundra, New South Wales Road. Could you please tell me how long the sanctuary at Corumban Beach, Queensland has been open to the public? I'd like to see the birds fed and approximately how many birds do they feed and what do they feed them? Well, this is a new part of the sanctuary where they feed the waterfowl twice a day. We're also going to have a look at the original part of the sanctuary, which has become famous for the thousands of lorikeets which flock there twice a day to be fed. Every morning and afternoon, hundreds of waterfowl gather at this spot and wait for their regular feeding session. The noise and activity increases when the food is served. All tastes are catered for. The menu is grain or a fish mixture.
Alex Griffith is the man responsible for the sanctuary from its humble beginning to this complex which now employs 72 people. Alex saves a tasty tidbit for one of his favourites. This pelican was brought here badly injured and was nursed back to health at the sanctuary. No birds or animals are confined here unless they are incapable of survival in the wild. The birds are not the only ones who appreciate some extra food and the kangaroos are always a favourite with children. A ride on the working model steam train is more than just a ride. It is an excellent way to appreciate the full scope of the sanctuary. Originally only three and a half acres, the sanctuary now covers over 50 acres. The area is mostly bushland. What landscaping has been carried out has been with the needs of the birds and animals kept in mind. It is the lorikeets that have made Corumban Sanctuary famous throughout the world. What are you doing there, Jim? Mixing up the food for the lorikeets this afternoon. What is it actually? I say it's bread, but what's the rest of it? A mixture of bread, honey and water in the proportion of two loaves of bread, four pounds of honey and two gallons of water to each bucket. And how many buckets would you use in a day? Uh, well, yesterday we used 46 pounds of... 46 loaves of bread and 92 pounds of honey. Yeah, that's that's, a, lot, that's right? about average, yes. This spectacular display had a very humble beginning. When Alex Griffiths came to Corumban with his parents, he was a beekeeper and flower grower. The beautiful colours of the gladioli he grew attracted various small honey eaters to his garden. As they climbed over the flowers seeking nectar, their sharp claws ruined the magnificent blooms. The solution to the problem was to feed the birds their nectar in another part of the garden away from the flowers. From small groups of people buying flowers and stopping to watch the birds has grown the biggest tourist attraction in Queensland. It is estimated that over 600,000 people visit the sanctuary each year. The majority of the birds visiting the sanctuary are the rainbow lorikeet and scaly-breasted lorikeets. They normally would range over the whole of the east coast of Australia following the blossoms of various nectar-bearing native trees, such as eucalyptus, tea tree and banksia. Now that they have become accustomed to the regular feeding at the sanctuary, they remain in the area all year. laws, if Alex Griffith were to begin feeding birds in his garden today, he could be stopped and the sanctuary would not be. As it is, however, the sanctuary is very much part of Australia today, and Alex has arranged that even after his lifetime, it will go on indefinitely in trust as a permanent, protective area for wildlife.
a little of the cheesemaker. We have a letter from Jennifer Muggeridge of Winalia, Tasmania. As small cheese manufacturers have almost died out in Australia, I thought the viewers may be interested to see the old methods in operation in our local cottage industry in Winalia. Well, this is Rosewood, where the cheese is made on the farm. The milk is pumped into a large stainless steel vat, while Claire Howard mixes a special bacterial culture to be added to the milk. I'm just about to make the cheese culture, which we use to start our cheese off each day. We feed this every day to continue the strain. Uh, today I'm having to make a new strain because yesterday the one that we were using was slow, which means that we feel the culture was dying. I'm making one up, which is one that we were feeding. We have two that we keep going every day, which we use to start the cheese off in the morning. This large one is added to a vat full of milk and is uh, the main cause of cheese being cheese. Bevis adds the culture to the vat of milk. This produces lactic acid from the milk sugar, which helps to give the cheddar cheese its characteristic flavour. The acid content is checked. When it reaches the correct level, rennet is added, then a small amount of cheese colouring. After mixing these in, it is left for the rennet to set the milk into a junket. We're now going to test the uh, curd to see whether or not it's ready to cut up. You put your finger in it like that and turn your finger around and just lift it up and if the curd tears in a straight line, it's ready. That cuts the curd so that we'll be able to cook it. Steam is passed through pipes in the vat, which cooks the curds and helps separate the whey. the cheese up here. Uh, previous to this I worked in a bank and knew nothing whatever about cheese and uh, when we moved up here uh, my wife's uncle Mr Claude Lefebvre at St Helens came up here and he spent about a fortnight with us teaching us how to make it and when he went home we thought we knew all about it but we soon found out that we didn't and we had a hot line between here and St Helens for a long time afterwards. It took us nearly all one day just to make one batch of cheese. It was rather chaotic and I don't think I'd like to go through it again. Just about a lost art. For, uh, uh, very few people involved in it. There's only three of us in Tasmania and as far as I know there is no one else in Australia making it. All the uh, small farm cheese producers have gone out of business. I'm now going to test the curd to see whether it's cooked. You get a handful like that in your hand and you squeeze it and if it doesn't come out between your fingers it's cooked. So it's cooked now and we're ready to run the way off. This next process is called cheddaring. We cut the uh, curd into slabs and we leave it for probably three quarters of an hour. Could take longer depending on what the acid is. The lactic acid level is still rising and it helps to expel the whey and fuse the curds together. It sticks together now. Yes, it does. Is it or do you just turn it once? Oh, we turn it two or three times, depending on how long it takes for the acid to get high enough. The curds are cut and chopped into chips, to which salt is added. Uh, we now stir the curd to mix the salt with it and the curd will curd down. We leave it for about a quarter of an hour, uh, during which time we stir it three times. And uh, this is to cool the curd and to mix the salt in with it. 
and also to break up any lumps that are in it. Salted curds are packed in metal hoops to be pressed. put these 10 pound cheeses in the press uh, we put them under the press for a little while and then take them out and we cap them and then we put them back in the press and uh, leave them there until tomorrow. The next day cheddar cheese is removed from the hoops to be stored whilst the cheese matures. The name cheddar comes from the English town of Cheddar where this type of cheese was first made. We keep the cheeses here in our storage room for probably up to three or four months uh, and they're much better eating at that time, although some people do like them very new and uh, we'll buy them straight out of the press when they're about a day old. Is the uh, techniques you use the same as those the early settlers would have used? Yes, uh, very much the same. The only advantage is that we have uh, specially prepared starters provided by the agriculture department which these people didn't have and there must have been great cheese makers to have been able to get any cheese that was any good at all because they kept some whey from the previous day's making to make the next lot of cheese and if the whey that they had was no good well they must have been in trouble. The Howards can sell all the cheese they can make which is about 40 kilos a day. The art of farm made cheese lives on in Winnalia in Tasmania. <laughs> Ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, travel all over the countryside. Ask the Leyland brothers. Whatever it is that you want to see, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, no matter whatever that happens to be. Ask the Leyland brothers.